Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the season opening for Healthcare Hour. I'm Uri Koskinen, Associate in Research and Business Impact at Haskin School of Business. In Haskin Hour, we pair faculty with business professionals to provide you with unique insights. Today's topic is enhancing startup success, which is of course a very important and exciting topic for Calgary and Alberta as we diversify our economy. Uh, today we are webcasting from Calgary. Our city is located on the traditional territories of the People Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising of the Siksika, the Paikani, and Gainai First Nations, as well as the Tuchina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Berspo, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the mediation of Alberta Region 3. The University of Calgary is situated on land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River, and the traditional Blackfoot name for this place is Bogistis, which we know about the city of Calgary. I am looking forward to a lively discussion today. We have the Q&A open, so we encourage you to type in your questions and comments at any time. You may also upvote for the questions that you want to be answered. We may not be able to get all, to all your questions today, but we will try our best. Our moderator today is Dr. Alice DeConing. Alice is a teaching professor of entrepreneurship at the Haskell School of Business, RBC, RBC teaching fellow in entrepreneurial thinking and academic director, Hunter Hub of Entrepreneurial Thinking. Well, there's a lot of thinking there, but Alice does a lot of thinking. So Alice, over to you, please. That was a good start, a Zoom mute. So good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, so Calgary's uh, startup ecosystem is uh, now valued at about $2.7 billion. And the city is a, a hotbed for innovation with more patents per capita than the rest of Canada. So there's no doubt that startups will play a big role in the future of Calgary and Alberta. Developing a startup is both an art and a science. And we invite you to join us as we bring together a Haskin researcher, Dr. Michael Robinson, along with Dr. Terry Rock, the president and CEO of Platform Calgary. Together, they will share some of the specific steps needed to develop an effective startup with insights from research and from experience. Expect some statistics, some debate, and an opportunity to ask your questions. And before we start, let me just uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, so Dr. Terry Rock is the President and CEO of Platform Calgary, as I said. Platform Calgary, along with uh, partners in the Calgary Innovation Coalition, are driven to make Calgary a global hub for startups and innovation by increasing the number of technology startups in Calgary by 10 times to 3,000 core tech startups by 2031. So an ambitious goal for us. Prior to joining Platform Calgary, Dr. Rock has been executive director of the Alberta Small Breweries Association and founding CEO for, of the Calgary Arts and Development Authority. He uh, worked on civic partnerships at the city of Calgary and was an assistant professor in strategy briefly with us at the University of Calgary. <laughs> Felt like a long uh, time. <laughs> before we uh, before we let uh, Terry uh, take off with the conversation, I'll introduce right away Dr. Michael Robinson as well. Um, Dr. Robinson is a professor and the Chang Fong uh, Fellow in Entrepreneurial Finance in the Haskin School of Business. He was the first site lead for the Creative Destruction Lab, Rocky's program, and continues to serve as its academic director. He founded the Calgary Portfolio Management Trust Program, a hands-on student investment fund 
at the Haskane School of Business in 1993. So you can see he's got a long track record in this space. Earlier in his career, Dr. Robinson was a venture capitalist while on a three-year leave from the University of Calgary, where he was the lead investor for several multi-million dollar investments in high technology firms in Western Canada. So to start this um, discussion, we're going to have a brief um, statement from Terry and a brief statement from Michael, and then we're going to um, open up the discussion. And so Terry, please. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Alice. Um, I'm gonna just gonna give you a quick overview of uh, Platform Calgary real quick. Um, so Platform Calgary's uh, reason for being is to build shared prosperity by making Calgary a global hub for startups and innovation. And Alice, as Alice talked about, that's really important for our city right now because we know that the long-term growth of, uh, of Calgary as a place to live and work uh, needs us to build new uh, ways of building prosperity that everyone can participate in. Cities around the world that have figured this out, um, figured out how to activate their tech ecosystem are seeing higher growth, they're seeing jobs being created. So how are we gonna do that? We focus on three things. Uh, place, we wanna create a community and a single point of entry, a door in downtown Calgary that I'll show you in a second, that you can walk in and get all the support you need if you're interested in starting a tech startup. Programs, stage and sector specific programming that's available, no matter where you are in your journey, you just maybe have an idea or you're thinking about you, you might wanna do it and see what, it, see what uh, being in a tech startup is all about. Two, I'm actually scaling and we can help you get on the right, uh, right track. And it doesn't matter really what industry you're in at all. And finally, partners. We have over 50 partners now. It's actually closer to 60. Uh, that are all part of the Calgary Innovation Coalition, that are global, uh, that can connect you um, wherever you need uh, to get uh, on your journey um, from a number of places you can see there. So yeah, we've got big goals. How are we going to get there? We think that this notion of connectivity of the ecosystem is really important. Lots of studies uh, have shown that to uh, to grow your ecosystem, you need to connect people up. And it doesn't even matter really how you connect them up as long as they're connected. Startup founders that are highly connected grow faster and their companies grow bigger. So that's what uh, a real big part of what we, uh, why we exist. And it's all gonna be in the Platform Innovation Center right across uh, from the downtown library, the new library in East Village. Uh, yeah, that looks like uh, maybe a cruise ship. It's a parkade. Uh, that has 50,000 square feet dedicated to being Calgary's home for innovators. And we kind of got the keys to our space uh, yesterday and we'll be starting to move in over the fall and then we're gonna open it to the public in January. A one place you can go uh, to walk in and get the help you need. So um, that is, that's what we're about. Um, and uh, is this where I'm supposed to flip over to my poll question, Alice? This is? Okay, so one of the things that, that is very exciting is that um, tomorrow, I think it is, the uh, annual startup genome rankings come out. They look at cities and regions around the world and uh, give you an assessment where you are. And so we've been participating in this for about three years. And there's a top 40, but then there's an, uh, 100 emerging innovation ecosystems. And I'm interested to find out what people think uh, Calgary's ranking is on this, um, uh, uh, on this uh, scorecard. And as we talk today, I'll talk a bit about why we're there and what we can do to maybe go up a bit. So give us your, um, where you think Calgary ranks uh, as a top quartile, second, third, or bottom quartile. And as the votes come in, I guess we'll be surprised to find out where people think we are. <laughs> so what's interesting about this, and so maybe I'll tell people a bit about what goes into it. So uh, the, there's four factors that they look at. The first one is just what is the performance of your ecosystem? How much is it creating uh, in terms of enterprise value? And Alice mentioned that Calgary is at about $2.7 billion right now. Um, it also looks at 
um, the uh, amount of investment that's coming into your market? Uh, what is the reach of your market globally? And then where does your talent rank? And so it looks like we have uh, some answers in, and I'll tell you that uh, we are not the top quartile. We are actually in the third quartile. So over the past two years, and the, the, the new results come out tomorrow, I have an embargoed copy. Uh, we will be, um, oh, I can't say because I might get uh, in trouble, but we're definitely in the third quartile, which means somewhere between 50 and 75 uh, in the top 100 is where Calgary ranks. So we'll talk about that as we go today. Thanks. Over to Michael. Okay, excellent. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here today uh, speaking with Terry. I'm a huge fan of what he and his team are doing at Platform Calgary. You'll hear more about that as we go forward today. Also, some of the exciting things that other organizations are doing in town. He mentioned there's sort of a one-shop stop for a lot of the different initiatives that are on the city. I'm gonna talk about one that I have more familiarity with, which is the Creative Destruction Lab program here at the Haskane School of Business. I'm gonna talk about that in a couple of different ways. First, I'm gonna talk about it a bit from an academic perspective, because one of the things Alice identified before my background was uh, some time spent in the venture capital industry. And one of the things that venture capitalists are very good at is pattern recognition. And they can identify what are the likely descriptors of a corporation that will indicate its probability of success. And so I'm going to cycle back on that because I'm doing research in that using some data from the Creative Destruction Lab Rockies program. And so we'll see some of that come up in the discussion a little bit later. But one of the things also as I built the program here initially with help from a team here at the Haskane School was I got to interact with all of our post-secondary institutions across Alberta. So University of Alberta, Lethbridge, Alberta University of the Arts, Old College, SAIT, so we've got some world leading technology across a number of different post-secondary institutions. It's not just at the university level, as you might think. So we've got wonderful talent, great young folks coming up with wonderful ideas about how they're gonna change the world. And the Creative Destruction Lab was really to give them some guidance in terms of what should you do next as you go through your journey. And so that program has pulled together a number of participants that have not really traditionally been together. So we've got some of our entrepreneurs who made a lot of, uh, had a lot of success, made a lot of money in the energy industry. And they got paired up in the CDL program with some tech entrepreneurs that have been very successful in that space. And they get to collide as Terry had identified and, and identify opportunities that they heard about. And so it's nice to see this coming together of these, not diverse, but sort of teams that hadn't really worked together in the past. And their focus is helping these early stage entrepreneurs get going. Now, the ones I look at, in the CDL Rockies program are really science-based. So they're high tech oriented. It's, it's a very narrow slice of the marketplace. Terry's constituent base is much broader than that. But I will tell you what I've found from the research that we've done as we go forward here. But the important thing is that if corporations are provided with critical advice at key stages of their development, it can radically accelerate their development. So this is kind of a message out to the entrepreneurs that you know don't be shy about reaching out to assistance for assistance. The other point is that the assistance is there. And I'll just share an anecdote to give you a sense of the Calgary community and the ecosystem here. So when we were being offered the opportunity to bring the, to join the Creative Destruction Lab network here at the Haskane School, we had to show that we had support in the community. And so the one of the metrics was, could you get people willing to provide donations to allow you to operate for a period of time. So we have these founding partners that committed to give us $100,000 a year for three years to give us the runway to operate because the university is not funding this, the community is funding it. And just anecdotally, we uh, the agreement we had with the Rotman School of Management was we had to show at least three people willing to do this in the community and no more than seven. So we had a meeting, uh, invited the community down to the Petroleum Club and in one night we had 10. And so we go back to Toronto and say, do we have 10? Because you said no more than seven. I said, fine, you can have 10. And then we wound up with 12, actually, as it turned out. So that just gives you a sense of the support in the community for this kind of initiative. Uh, just, again, anecdotally, uh, the Sauter School, University of British Columbia, started a year before us with their programming in the CDL uh, network. And they're like three years behind us in terms of fundraising. So three years later, they still hadn't raised as much money as we did in one day. 
we being the community here in Calgary. So that gives you a sense of, you know, the support that you can look for in the community. It, 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 it comes, you know, with conditions in the sense that you have to respect those people providing that support. And I'll talk more about that as we go forward, but, but that's sort of my introduction and hopefully a warm up to some of the data that we're gonna present later on here. So uh, thank you, uh, Michael, and thank you, Terry. So both of them are telling us that we have a great city. We have a city that has mechanisms for bringing together investors and entrepreneurs and other supporters. And uh, the world is our oyster, I guess, is uh, what they're trying to tell us. And so as we go forward, I'd like to dig into that. And um, you've already given us a, a CDL Rocky's unique start story, Michael. Maybe you could continue by giving us some detail on uh, what your research at the CDL companies has shown and then what the founders need to do. And then from there, we'll, um, I have to remember, <laughs> sorry, I'm looking at the script. And then Terry, we'll, we'll, we'll do the flip side with Platform Calgary, and then we're gonna uh, have another poll. Thank you. Yeah, happy to continue the discussion. And, uh, you know, I, I, I love telling this story. It's, it's a compelling story. Again, the idea for the CDR Rockies program is to take those very high potential university research oriented post secondary institution research oriented entities and provide them with the support they need to grow and it's not just alberta or calgary it's the prairies and it's the world basically because we've got an energy stream that draws in from around the world the best of class the intent is that they'll come here and see the wonderful ecosystem and and set up shop here and many of them have done that actually so it's part of the growth process is to attract good ventures that are already started um, and so the streams that are there are general science stream and energy stream. And just last year was added an ag bio food security stream. And that's been quite successful. Um, but stats coming out of this, uh, since the program started in 2017, there's been 192 ventures uh, registered in the program. Uh, less than half have graduated from the program. And I'll talk about that a little bit more fully on uh, later on. Of those 192, 107 are Canadian and, and 86 are from Alberta, broadly defined. Uh, keeping track of their ability to attract financing, which is a key element of growth for corporations. Uh, since 2019, uh, the CDL Rockies alumni firms have raised over $320 million US to help fuel their growth. And in terms of economic activity, typically we say there's a four to one factor of uh, economic growth associated with the money that goes in. So that's over a billion dollars of economic value created through this process. Now that's across all the, all the ventures, uh, just over half of that is for the Canadian ones, uh, 160 million of the 320. So half is from Alberta based and uh, 120 is from Calgary based venture. So this has been a great mechanism for getting money into the hands of these uh, wonderful entrepreneurs that are working on leading edge research that's trying to change the way people look at the world. Now, these are very early stage uh, A lot of them are less than five employees, about 90% of them have less than five employees. Uh, a third of them are still in the ideation phase. Uh, about 35% were in the pre-seed financing round stage, 22% uh, seed, and only 10% were seeking Series A financing. So these are really small, very early, but with huge potential trajectory. And one of the messages for those people that aren't in the tech sector is that, you know, it's not just the technology folks that are going to drive the success of these businesses. They need support they need people to help them with their marketing plans. They need people to help them with their branding. So some of the great work they do at the Alberta University of the Arts in terms of developing brand recognition and things like that. Uh, some of the work that's necessary for compliance, quality control, customer relationships. So this isn't just a story about you know, the, the people from the science and the medical faculties. It's about the universities and the post-secondaries broadly defined providing the, the horsepower, if you will, to help these entities grow. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more fully about some of the, the outcomes later on, but one of the things that happens in this program, and this is where the value comes in, and if you're ever giving advice to an entrepreneur or you're an entrepreneur seeking advice, it's useful to be very specific about what they should be working on. And so that's one of the keys of this CDL Rockies program is the fact that the advice is targeted at a specific point in time in the development of that corporation. So it's not just well, you should think about this. It's about, no, you should go talk to these five customers at this point in time. You should come back with an uh, MOU of at least this value. 
So they're very targeted. And so, you know, as an entrepreneur, look for people that can provide you with direct support at your stage of development. And also if you're uh, providing that support, you know, take the time to understand what that entrepreneur is looking to do and, and get into their head a little bit and think about how can I really help this person at this point in time? And so some of the data that comes out of this, we all know that, you know, product market fit is the most important thing for an entity to develop and to determine over time. And that's, you know, a key for any entrepreneurs to figure out what's their product market fit. How do we satisfy customer needs better than anyone else out there? I'm a finance guy by background, so I do acknowledge that, you know, marketing does have its value in the world. Uh, but that's not the sole story. And that's partly what I found from analyzing these uh, results from the CDL Rockies data. There's what uh, we call them deliverables. Each entrepreneur is given a to-do list. Here's two to four things you have to work on over the next eight weeks to dramatically accelerate the development of your business. And so I studied those and said, okay, what, what buckets do they fall into? So about 60 to 70% are product market fit oriented, which you would expect that is pretty important for any corporation uh, at any stage of development. But more interestingly, 21% of them dealt with financing. You know, you got to go and identify where you're going to raise the capital for this round and subsequent rounds. And one of the CEOs of one of our uh, alumni company tells me that they spend as much time on doing their sort of funnel, if you will, their sales funnel for potential investors as they do for their customer funnel. So it's important to be thinking about that ahead of the time when you need it. And the other piece is, and we'll come back to this with one of our poll questions a little bit later, is the importance of governance, broadly defined. In my world, I think of governance as creating an effective organizational structure that can handle the ups and downs associated with the, the trajectory that an early stage corporation uh, experiences. And so about uh, just under 20% of the deliverables dealt with that critical aspect of building a successful corporation. I'll, I'll, I'll cycle back on that later on. So those are some of the statistics I found from the, the, the study. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a positive story, if you will. Thanks, Michael. Go ahead, Terry. Well, I mean, I think that what I, what I love about that, I'm just going to pick up on the whole thing. Like if I'm talking to, when we, when we, sorry, when we built the Platform Innovation Center concept, it was, I was thinking a lot about I, this scenario where I have a friend who is out of work or looking, you know, maybe they want a career change or whatever. Maybe they're a student and they're looking for a path and where, if they wanted to start a company, be an entrepreneur, maybe in tech, is there a place you can send them that they can get the advice they need? And that's a, a, one of the sort of scenarios we think about. It's like, we, there's a place, you didn't even need to know what goes on in there. And you can tell them what to do. But before that, even, I think a lot of people have this view that they need to be a techie. They need to have, you know, some technical chops in order to start a, a company that can grow and employ people. And I think what's really interesting about some of the data that we've been looking at is that that the the we often think that the sort of you know I'm going to invent something or if you're a researcher in a lab and that's going to be the basis of the building. But if you look at the Benevides and Solium, which is now Morgan Stanley Shareworks, these big Calgary success stories, they aren't actually coming from the technology first, they're coming from a need from a customer that someone has then gone out to build a team and competencies around to, uh, to solve that problem and through iteration and then, but yeah, of course there's technical people involved, but what's coming first is this really big problem that they wanna solve. And I think what's interesting about being in Calgary right now is think about where we're strong, energy, food and ag, transportation and logistics, like these are areas that even if you think about all of our head offices, like head office problems, these are things that are big, massive problems with, that, that have global markets that we can address right here in Calgary. Um, and you talk about the kinds of jobs where I'm going with this is that uh, Craig uh, Elias from Bow Valley College has done some research on what is the distribution of jobs that come with a tech company. And uh, the, I've just pulled it up right here. And 45% of the jobs are tech related. Um, and the rest are things like marketing and sales, business, finance, and admin, people related, that kind of a thing. So um, there's a lot going on and a lot of benefits from growing this sector. 
uh, and encouraging people to take that step. Um, and setting them up to do it right is super important. So our programs at Platform, the ones that we directly deliver are in the space of, it's a kind of a technical term, pre-acceleration, meaning it's all of the stuff that from idea through to, okay, I'm set up to now I'm maybe starting to build a team, but really it's about that intersection with the market and putting your ideas to test so you can improve them and actually find out if there's something there for someone to uh, buy. And then you have a business and that's where we we think of ourselves as a feeder to the creative destruction labs of the world or the global accelerators. Um, and so that's that's sort of how we've positioned it. And I think one of the sort of messages here is that when we sort of scan Calgary and how I would like to summarize this is like the kind of work that we're doing, we're all doing, there's no better place in the world to be doing this right now because we've got so much dry powder uh, we've got capital, we've got entrepreneurial experience here in other sectors, um, we've got really talented people. So Calgary, Alberta is going to emerge quickly um, into the ranks of the global tech uh, cities. Thank you, Terry. I think it's a good time for us to put the uh, poll up. And uh, while we're doing that, uh, I'd just like to make the observation that uh, we started looking at research-based and um, then we went to Platform Calgary and, and Terry reminded us that, you know, it's not necessarily that the tech or research drives the business. Sometimes it's the customers that are driving the creativity in the business. And uh, yeah. here in Calgary, we're, we're positioned to do all of that. So if you could all uh, just click on your, your thing, answer there yeah. for that first question. And uh, while we wait for the poll results, maybe uh, well, would I would, like I, to add something? Well, what, what I think is interesting about that is who are the customers that are here? Like, mm -hmm. like so if you're starting a company in Calgary, Alberta, um, I uh, happen to co-chair the um, innovation agenda team uh, as part of the Calgary economic strategy. And our vision is to make Calgary Canada's leading business to business innovation ecosystem. Yeah. Because we have these problems to solve that are business problems. And a lot of our, uh, if you think about where we're going to get economic growth from, highly exportable businesses and technologies is that is solving those business to business problems. Um, just today, Tugboat Logic uh, was announced that they were, they sold Calgary based company, serial entrepreneur that this, you know, I don't know how many it is of his, but. Um, another Calgary-based company that's solving business problems um, being sold. So fantastic story there. That's actually an interesting observation because we're a small city and we're mm. surrounded by um, a thousand miles of grass and mountains. And so you can almost see us as an island state together with uh, Edmonton. So here we are, we've got this innovation hub. There's just not enough consumers to drive yeah. a consumer business. But that doesn't stop us from serving businesses around the world. And we have the global connections, not just through our business connections, but also through our immigrant communities who are connected to pretty much every country in the world. So uh, a lot of opportunity if we only have the imagination to respond to that. So um, thank you for voting, everyone. And there we go. Okay. So I would like Michael to address this, uh, this poll results. What do you think, Michael? Well, that was my question. It was a bit of a trick question, if you will, um, because uh, it's important in all stages, as you all know. So that was sort of shown from the result there. But uh, again, I'm, I'm going to just cycle back on this, uh, some earlier commentary that was there. And I, I totally agree. When I talk about the Creative Destruction Lab companies, these are science-based companies. So you've got science looking for a solution, if you will. But the other way traditional entrepreneurship is somebody has a deep understanding of customer needs as Solium and Benevity did, and then work backwards to come up with a solution to satisfy those customer needs. So it's useful to kind of identify, you know, what which direction you're going here. I mean, there's no right or wrong answer to it, but certainly the results I'm going to show are on the science-based looking for a solution or looking for a customer and, and trying to find a product that could satisfy customer needs. I also think that, you know, one of the things that I, I'm trying to do this to, help people get encouraged, but what is a tech company? You know, that's a, that, like I've had this conversation so many times with people. 
I think sometimes these companies back into being tech companies where they found a really interesting problem to solve. And the only way to solve it is to advance science somehow or advance the technology. And so they get in the business of creating the technology that's going to do that. And then you recognize on this whole notion of where the market is, is that you know, markets are global and it's, it's relatively, you, you know, we say that we really want companies that are born global. They should be looking at global markets. Um, the fact that, uh, you know, maybe you don't have a buyer in your backyard um, is a, it's frustrating, but it shouldn't stop your growth. And um, we, in fact, we had a little webinar like this a little while ago with three Calgary companies that are doing business internationally. And we learned live that none of them had a local customer. It was a, it was a really intriguing moment, but they're building fantastic businesses and they have, they're selling zero in Calgary. Yeah, no, and that's that was one of my messages at the end is think big, you know, as an entrepreneur, think of yeah. the world as your market. Don't think of, you know, Strathmore or Calgary or Alberta yeah. as, your, as your marketplace. Um, as, but let me back up to the question of governance. And so where this came from was, again, going back to the idea of pattern recognition as something that a venture capitalist and a sophisticated investor uses to screen because the, the most important item in a most important thing that a venture capitalist has is their time. So yeah. they want to devote their time to the most likely uh, companies that are going to succeed. And so one of the things they do is they come up with screening mechanisms. And so one of the things I looked at was when I looked at the creative destruction lab, I mentioned before that there's these deliverables that get created. But the other thing that get, happens is that some ventures are cut from different sessions. And so in order to stay in the program, you have to su attract support from a mentor or at least one mentor. And if nobody yeah. is willing to support you, then you're not allowed to continue in the program. So I looked at, you know, what was the history of those companies that graduated from a given session? And, and what I found was about 80% of the time a company will graduate from one session to the next. There's, there's five sessions throughout the course of a, a nine month time period. So graduating is important because you get that mentor support, you get MBA student support, you potentially get to raise capital as we talked about down the road as, you, as your company evolves. So about the metric is about 80%. But I found if you're only working on the product market side, if only the, the, the only deliverables you have that uh, you think as the entrepreneur important and everyone agrees with you are on your product market fit, then you're less than 75% of the time will you be invited to continue. Whereas if your deliverables span the set of product market fit, governance, and financing, there's a 90% chance you're going to be invited to continue. And this cycles back. I, one of the things I'm doing, I'm doing research uh, through this mechanism, but also talking to people. I'm interviewing venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, angel investors to find out what are you looking for and, and what advice can you give to an entrepreneur as they go to start their business. And so one of the key messages is that we don't invest, this is venture capitalists now, we don't invest in founders, we invest in CEOs. And Angels will invest in a founder once, and then yeah. they expect to see some growth from that individual. And so what I'm taking away from this data and from these interviews is the fact that, you know, you as an entrepreneur have to think differently now. Sure, you've come up with an idea, you've got some technology, if you're coming at it from that, or you've, you understand a little bit of the market, but you have to build an organization. And this is the governance piece coming back to that. Governance isn't just about creating a board. It's about creating a founder's agreement, shareholder's agreements, vesting agreements. There's a series of things you want to do up front that if you don't do it properly, you're going to run into trouble. A lot of venture capitalists tell me we don't invest in companies because the team's going to blow apart. We can see yeah. that just looking at them. So if you're not thinking about those things from day one, you're going to run into trouble. I've interviewed some lawyers and they say that the bulk of their business is on what they call pay me later files where if someone had taken some time early on to think about these issues and you know, work their way through it, and it's not that expensive early on to put in place some good agreements. And Terry, your organization might have some links to groups that can provide that kind of support. Yeah, well, you know, I think I have a couple of thoughts here. Um, one- Can I, can I oh, jump ahead, in, I'll... Terry? Because we also have a really related question. So if I okay. read the question from Mike, and then maybe you can address it and, and also talk about Platform Calgary's part sure. in this. So uh, Mike writes, I am really excited to see YYC diversification into the tech space. I find a lot of entrepreneurs struggle to find meaningful connections that are important during ideation. Do you align customers with partners like in uh, Calgary, like Shred Cons Accountant, 
or export Canada development, tech lawyers, bankers, and even just mentors. And I, I'm connecting this to, to what Michael said because, you know, does it really cost that much to have a lawyer to put that contract together properly at an early stage? Uh, yeah. Can we find those mentors? So Terry, take it away, please. Okay, so what, there's a lot there. What, one of the reasons why we called ourselves Platform was to make sure that exactly that problem is being solved. So uh, in my experience, when I'm looking at my product market fit, it's, you know, or the problem we're solving is we, we get people excited about diversification tech. And then it be, it's just like a overwhelming kind of sea of things that you could do. And how do you, you know, what do you do? What's the right next step? So we have, uh, we have five guiding principles. The first one is collaborate first. The second one is love founders. And we're always trying to be in the founder's corner. So Creative Destruction Labs is a fantastic program that it puts Calgary on the map and it isn't for everyone. Just like the Haskane School of Business, or sorry, the, uh, the Hunter Hub for Entrepreneurial Thinking in the University of Calgary is a great program for students, doesn't cover the whole thing. But the reality is that there's actually support there at every stage and every sector. Um, and so we have this thing we call the 15 minute promise and 15 minutes you can walk through the door and find someone who's gonna get you on track, not solve all your problems, but get you moving in the right direction. So the answer to that question is absolutely, those things are there, they are accessible. Uh, and in January, you're literally gonna be able to walk in the door, there's gonna be someone there, um, whether it's just a mentor or uh, a specific program or a workshop that you can do, you'll be able to access everything, not just in the building uh, itself, but into the whole community. And uh, that sort of defragmentation is, is a big part of what we're doing. But you can go further. So a couple of examples of partners we have, the National Angel Capital Organization will be opening their angel investor hub called Canada Zone in the Platform Innovation Center. Um, and just taking NACO as an example, and not to take business away from lawyers, but at the earliest stage, it really, this stuff is templatable. You can use standard templates. Investors are looking for kind of standard approaches. They don't want a lot of creativity around how deals are structured. There's a few kind of standard ways you can do it. You can save a whole bunch of time for everyone by going on a tried and true path for this kind of thing. Maybe I'm just gonna interject. Work. There's, there's yeah. templates, but you better take your time to work through those. Yes, templates. yes. It's, I'm <laughs> not saying you just pull one off the shelf and do it, but you have a lawyer that works with you. And then what they do is when you're talking to an investor that's made a few investments, they're just looking at a red line version and seeing how it's different from the standard. And I think that's kind of the key. Like, how do you make this go faster? Is you start from this tried and true stuff and go forward. Um, and it is super important um, that we do that. Uh, so just take that concept of, you know, there actually are um, some playbooks out there that can help this whole thing go faster, that other places have adopted and they move on them. And so not everything has to be created unique to Calgary, um, but we should steal lots and lots of things from around around the world. I'm just going to add one other yeah. comment to the raising capital. And uh, it's interesting, I heard a great comment by Dr. Chen Fong talk about uh, angels will invest in your company once to learn about you. And this is one of the key yes. things for an entrepreneur is to learn that you have to respect the capital and you yeah. have to respect the people that are putting their time and effort and money behind you. And so don't take it for granted. You know, build a relationship. Let's go back to the relationship piece. Uh, things that angel investor. I'm an angel investor. Angel investors hate it if you, you know, a day before you run out of money, you come up and say, oh, we're running out of money. We need to check right now. It's like, no, keep them in the loop. Keep them informed. Let them yeah. know what's happening throughout this whole process. They want to be part of this. They want to support you as you go forward. So, so learn how to respect the capital. And yeah, the NACO agreements are wonderful uh, templates that you can draw upon and, and learn yeah. the language. There's a whole language around yes. this that's, that's important to understand. And the other piece I'll add is there's this, you know, the sense that, you know, people are being onerous as they ask for this. Venture capitalists have certain yeah. responsibilities to their limited partners. And so when they ask for certain things, it's, that's where you want advice. Is this reasonable? Is it not reasonable? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's some, um, uh, one of the, I guess, just talk a bit about our, our, our junction program that's kind of been our focus for a while is we build back from the conversation you wanna have with an investor or someone who's gonna take a, a chance on you. 
And what are the, what are the questions they're going to ask you? And so we basically turned that into we're going to help these early stage companies build the framework of a data room that tells their whole story, 360 degree view on their market, on their structure, and all the pieces. It doesn't have everything done, but it does create a bit of a roadmap of what the problems you have to solve organizationally, governance-wise, et cetera. And so after this nine-week program, they build that. But the other thing that we focus on is the founder themselves. And this is like one of the, you talk about people investing one time in the learning and all that. The great new book called uh, uh, Super Founders just recently out looking at the differences between founders of billion dollar uh, companies and those who, who exited earlier or had a smaller company. What's the biggest differentiator between them? The differentiator is that the, that the ones that are highly successful tend to have been on their second, third or fourth venture where they actually learned how to do all these things that you talked about, Michael. It's hard to classroom, you know, pr you know tell someone how to manage people um, you know, we're dealing with COVID right now and trying to open a public building. Well, you know, no one can teach me how to do that. I'm drawing on deep reserves of, of, of things that I've done in the past to, to move through that, um, this challenge. And um, so I think that's a really important thing that I think as we look at this from a citywide perspective, creating, getting the people that have exited to mentor back and then the people that are starting to make sure that we give them a founder mindset and that if the current venture they're on doesn't work, that we ensure that they are surrounded by support and that failure is just seen as part of the journey and not really failure at all. But you know, we're applauding people for taking those chances. And then when they need to get back on the horse, we help them get back on the horse, knowing that they've got valuable experience um, and a community that's supporting them. And let me, uh, I'm very quickly, much Michael, this because we've got a lot of questions, so okay. we're going to have to do uh, one two, minute two, answers two, soon. Two <laughs> quick thoughts. Um, one is the whole idea, what does success mean? And so one of the things we see in the Creative Destruction Lab is that a lot of the founders are scientists. And, yeah. you know, at some point they go, you know, I really don't want to be a CEO. Or their investors say, you know, do you really want to be CEO? And so that notion of failure, if, if, if the company yeah. outgrows you, that is success. That is not a failure. Yes. So, so do not be afraid of that as an outcome through this whole process and and, and embrace that as an opportunity to, to learn and to grow. You're right. I mean, uh, one of the, again, when I was working in venture capital, there was, uh, we'd go to these pitch competitions and, you know, people would say, I like this guy. I don't like this person or what have you. But they'd say, one of the, the things they'd say is that person knows. That's the language they use. And that goes back to Terry's comment about, you know, yeah. people that have been there, done that, understand what it takes to build yeah. a successful and think mm -hmm. about you're not building a widget, you're building a company. Yes. That's the mindset you've got to got, yeah. have to have. What does it take to build a company? Anyway, yeah, I'm exactly. done. Okay, so we're going to do rapid fire now, okay. because otherwise we're not even going to even start. So just remember that rapid fire. Okay, first question. Does Platform Calgary offer support to social enterprise startups? Or is it solely based in the tech space? So yeah, there's you know definitional issues here, um, but I would say because uh, you can be really, both, right? You yeah, could be a tech really social looking, enterprise. Yeah, we're really looking for something that is going to operate that, that's driven by innovation, is going to operate at scale, um, and so uh, the answer is uh, yes. We will be in social uh, innovation, social um, enterprise, particularly social tech, because that's where the scale is going to happen. And when you, I'm also just going to say that it's our whole community that's there. So you will be, you will feel welcome as a social innovator in the space and you're, you'll have a community with you. Yeah. Okay. So a related question uh, to the whole financing issue is the flip side, which is a question I like. Um, how successful are bootstrap tech companies? Do you need funding in order to scale? And of course, um, I've been in this field for a long time. I know lots of examples of companies that have grown uh, without any outside financing at all. One of the more famous ones that I enjoy reading about is I uh, Baby Einstein, which grew for 10 years before a very successful, um, uh, they sold a company to another company and they were anti-debt and they actually managed to do it. But it takes excellent management, hyper excellent management. Um, Terry, I was wondering if in connection with this question, you could um, show that slide you had about how many companies 
and all the different size mm. companies that we need yeah, in right. order to achieve our 2031 goal here. Yeah. Because I think that's very much tied to this, you know, who's who's the companies that are going to go for financing and which are the ones that are going to do it with family and friends and which yeah. ones are going to be self-financed. Well, what's the um what's the email marketing company that just sold to uh into it? Uh I, I don't remember. It's the, biggest, it's the biggest bootstrapped uh, company in in, uh, in in history of an exit. Uh, and it's just slipping my mind right now, but I use it all the time. Uh, or I had used it back when I had to do that. Uh, so what we do is, is we actually are looking at the size of companies. And this is actually done by uh, serial uh, founder Brad Zumwalt has created this uh, this project where he's tracking all the companies. He's one of our main patrons uh, as a donor into platform to, to help us get off the ground. And I just look at this, you know, as this is the the work. The work is to help us create, take really small one to five person startups, and as a whole community, uh, put our resources to turn them into five to 20 person startups and from there to 20 to 50 and 50 to 100. Uh, and and that's where, that's how we're gonna create prosperity in our city. And so, you know, right now we we track about 800. This, this is a little bit of old data, but we track about 800 companies. These are the logos of the ones that we have on our radar. Um, and over time, we need to sort of fill the back end of the funnel and it's kind of a distribution with goals of each one and like, you know, this has all been, uh, there's a lot of work here to kind of look at the whole population of tech um, and try to figure out how we how we get there. So um, yeah, is that what you're talking about? Thank you. I'm sorry, I have to mute now because there's a lawnmower in the background, which is <laughs> gonna make me a little slower off the mark. Um, so next question, will Platform Calgary support startups throughout Alberta, the prairies? And yeah. second part, if startups are global in focus, what criteria will, will determine if they are Alberta or Calgary based? And, and you hinted at this, Michael, in talking about, you know, uh, Alberta and Calgary companies in CDL. But either one of you could address Go this. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah. Well, certainly... Uh, the, the definitions are not really that important, to be honest. I mean, it's about helping create an ecosystem. So the CDL Rockies is domiciled here, but it brings investors and corporations from around the world. So we're not uh, really concerned about, you know, defining them to be Calgary-based or Alberta-based. But we don't have we don't have that kind of mandate. I'm not sure what your mandate is, Terry. Well, my job, like I just look at my job on behalf of the citizens of Calgary is to is to create jobs of the future and make this a sticky place for, for youth. And like if I really get down to it, I want, I'm thinking about the people that are going to be working here over the next 20 years and and, and what's going to keep them here. Uh, I have three kids that are, that are in their 20s, uh, all living in Montreal right now, and that kind of freaks me out. Uh, just a couple of specific things is we run a startup visa program. So we, uh, over the past couple of years, have actually landed 30 companies in Calgary. Uh, we work with a foreign graduate startup visa program as well. So foreign graduate students from outside the province uh, can, through our program, uh, land in the city. Um, we have a partnership with Innovate Edmonton, uh, and we together are working on something called the Alberta Innovation Corridor, which is really about taking this ecosystem and moving it beyond. Because there's one thing we know for sure is that founders don't care if their if their investor or their talent is coming from Edmonton or Calgary. They they it's all about that and. We actually suffer from our two cities being uh, a bit too far apart to get that that connectivity there. So we're trying to do that. And as of, um, we'll be making some announcements in the next couple of days about a significant increase in that collaboration that's intended to serve uh, founders across the province. So we're excited about that. Um, I thought there was another part to that, but but effectively, you know, I, my end is to make Calgary an awesome ecosystem and have have people stick here uh, over time. Thank you. And the, and the lawnmower is gone, so we're we're back in business. <laughs> okay, so this is a question from uh, Sean Han. He's a Hasking MBA alumnus. So, if our company has been formed, our beta version of the software has been developed, a share structure has been developed, and a business model and business valuation model have been developed. How can the group speaking help us 
so you two, help us move, uh, help us move another made in Calgary company forward. Sorry, that was a little bit awkward. Um, so uh, as you know, time is money. So how do we help a company like that accelerate to the next stage? Um, so if you're still on campus, you would connect with perhaps Hunter Hub, and then that would have all kinds of programming and mentoring opportunities, et cetera. Um, but if you're not, let's say you are alumnus, you're off campus, you're of course always welcome to come back to the University of Calgary. But what about other people in our audience? They're ready to roll. Yeah, I mean, I think Hunter, Hunter Hub uh, is a happy open door to alumni uh, for sure. Um, and uh, I would just, so our program called Junction, uh, our sixth or seventh cohort is targeted at first time founders with a minimum viable product. And it's a nine week bootcamp where uh, it's been described to us by, you know, someone who has an MBA as a mini MBA, but the, I'm working just on my company. Like that, the work is all assignments are about making my company grow. Uh, and uh, that is available, but I think, think we closed applications for this fall uh, but starting in January there'll be a new round of things happening and then there's always you know a 100 mentorship opportunities uh, there's there's just a lot and you could just connect I would like from our standpoint go to platformcalgary.com and there right away it says it, the first thing you'll see is how to book a meeting with an advisor they'll listen to your story and get you on the right spot Perfect. The, the, other, the, the point I'll raise, uh, again, not institutionally oriented, but it's just, you know, you're, you're out there, you're building a business, you know, you, you have to be known for hustle. You, you identify people in town that have been successful and, and, and reach out to them. I mean, that's one of the takeaways from this as well, is that people are approachable in this community. And a lot of the folks that have been successful tell me that it's their peer network that has helped them to be successful, yeah. not just mentors that are outside and looking in from beyond, but people that are going through the same struggle that they are right now. Totally agree. That's, we, we, I'll just throw another. Yeah, please. We're, uh, we're like just stealing like crazy every great idea from other cities. Uh, and uh, so uh, Community Tech on Waterloo has pioneered this peer-to-peer -peer network thing. So again, go to our website, peer-to-peer -peer networks, uh, we're just, we're gonna blanket the community with peer-to-peer -peer networks so that founders can get help. If you're a HR person, you can get your peers connected, doesn't matter. And, and I my, would also, my, sorry, go, go ahead, ahead, Michael. No, no, you go ahead, Alison. I was through. just gonna say, I think that if one of our competitive advantages in Calgary, which we perhaps have not mentioned enough, is how approachable people are in yeah. the city. I've lived in many cities and uh, this is really a unique community. And for an, a company that's ready to roll, yeah, just reach out. Yeah. Almost anyone will give you a half hour if you're polite and uh, respectful for their time and come and ask you questions. I think I spent years in the arts and uh, like uh, doing similar work, but for the art sector. And uh, I came to the conclusion that this is, this is the home of improv where improv was created by UFC professor uh, Keith Johnstone in the theater sports was created. And it's the yes, let's city. And people, if you go for support, people will like accept that and then they'll join in with you to make it happen. I think that happens over and over and over in this city. So take advantage of it because it's not like that other places. No, it's not. And so it gives you a jump up. My only other comment is just make sure that your team is aligned. You know, take the time to really think about this. Like, you know, are some of you working full time somewhere else and this is a part time job? And all that. And one of the things as well is that whole idea about allocating founder shares. Have a really serious conversation about that because founder shares should be allocated on the basis of what you're going to do for the corporation, not what you've done to date. Because, you know, if somebody's working, you know, 724 and somebody else has their full time job and they're, you know, building up their pension, all stuff, and they say, and I own a quarter of the company and the other person's, you know, putting their heart and soul into it, it, it creates some difficulties down the road. So these are this, yeah. when I talk about governance, these are key issues that you have to talk about right up front as you create your corporation. You know what we learned through uh, when Startup Genome did a deep dive on Calgary, I don't know if you're experiencing this, but we were stingy on the use of options uh, specifically to advisors and that people were pretty holding it a bit tight compared to other regions where things just move faster. That's you want actually help? a good it's... observation. Yeah, you, you want, want help, help it, it costs. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and, uh, 
Yeah, an option is just an option. It's not cash out of your pocket. Yeah. 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 So I'm going to just, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the time. We're really hitting the wall here. Some great questions still. So first of all, I would, uh, Brent Zuber makes the point, um, appreciates uh, Michael's um, a definition of success. So if you're a scientist who has to hire a CEO and leave the company because it's grown beyond you, that's success. If you're the CEO who creates the global company, that's a success. And early on, Terry, you were giving an example of someone doing a fairly risky venture and it doesn't work out. That's also a success because it's a successful mm -hmm. journey. It may not have come to a as happy an ending as you want it, but it's still a success. And I think it's worth uh, emphasizing that. So we have, I believe, about one minute. So I'm going to take a question that was asked a long time ago, uh, but it's all moving on the screen. Um, how will how will these things, this kind of startup orientation, remodel Calgary and the Alberta business landscape in the near to midterm? And what are the implications for education? 30 seconds each. Well, I'll take the education one. Okay, so obviously our programming has to evolve to support this kind of initiative. Uh, one of the trends now in education is the notion of micro-credentials. So it ties in with what Terry was talking about, kind of just-in-time learning. And I'm actually doing some work with exec ed to create programming that is, I think, aligned. And I'll talk to Terry later about this, make sure that we're not overlapping too badly. But we have to think about how do we provide the support that entrepreneurs need when they need it. And yeah. with uh, online delivery, it's much easier to do that. So I'll pause there. Yeah, Terry? well, how does it reshape? I mean, we think of ourselves as an entrepreneurial place, but in tech, cities our size in Canada, if we were to triple the size of our tech sector, we would be uh, uh, only amongst the leaders. So I think you're going to see a whole bunch more dynamism. We, we have two words, volume and velocity, more companies going way faster. So that means for me, I like as a as a, like when I look at what I got to do tomorrow, I got to set things in motion with my team and the whole community that help us surface a thousand new tech founders uh, or founders of innovative, fast growing businesses and get them on track, get them part of a community so that we can get going. This Keep is going. Good. Yes, take it to the next level. So thank you, everyone. I'm going to um, turn it over to uh, Uriya Koskinen again, and those questions will not be forgotten. So um, it will probably post some answers for some of you, some links that will lead you to the right places. Um, and uh, glad you had, uh, glad to have you join us for this conversation. Well, thank you, uh, Michael and Jerry. You were excellent panelists and very engaging conversation. Uh, thank you, Alice, for uh, for your expert moderation. Even though you sometimes forgot to put your mic on, but that's that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had uh, 144 participants today, uh, and of course, this topic is so amazingly important. Like like Terry emphasized that we. We need to triple our tech sector in order to be among the leaders for this size of city in Canada. So we have ways to go. I mean, we do have a unique city. Like Alice said, said that I mean, this is the easiest place on earth to see people. So we have so many advantages, educated population, a lot of smart money around. Uh, but remember what Michael said, Michael is a finance professor like I am, that you have to respect capital. So it means that angel investors are not angels, they're investors first. So they wanna have a return on, on, on their investment. So you have to respect that, that, that okay, they also wanna make money, not only the entrepreneurs, everybody wants to make better off. Uh, but I've lived here in for, for five years and I've seen amazing change in the, in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So we are on the right way, we have still the ways to go. We have to learn how to scale up our entre uh, entrepreneurial firms. But I think the future is bright. We just have to keep on doing it and I have to be persistent and uh, the results will be amazing. So uh, next asking hour will be in uh, November. So take, stay tuned. Uh, a recording for this uh, uh, asking hour will be available in, a, in our website very, very shortly. And I would, finally, I would like to remind you that our evaluation survey will be emailed to you Please look at that and send it in our way. And once more, thank you so much for, for tuning in today. And thank you, Michael, Terry, and Alice for a very engaging and entertaining panel discussion. Thank you. Bye-bye.